Welcome back inside the den, folks. Got a jam-packed episode for you. With me, as always, is Chris Murray. Today, we're going to talk a little UNLV game, a little San Diego State preview. Um, but first things first, how about that loss on Saturday? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. I'm actually just finished an article. Uh, I call it the uh, Sour 16. So a lot of people know the Sweet 16. Obviously, Nevada football's lost 16 games in a row, and I'm kind of ranking them from most painful to least painful. And this is in the top three. Anytime you lose to UNLV at home with a really good crowd, 25,000 folks there, um, it's tough to swallow. And, you know, Nevada showed some good things offensively, but – when it's all said and done, they gave up 45 points. That's the third most in this rivalry's history. Um, they end up losing by 18 points. That's the fifth largest loss they've ever taken to UNLV. So, um, you know, it could have been a turning point in a positive way. As we talked about previewing the game, it ended up being a lot more of the same. And it's just got to be really frustrating not having consistency on one side of the ball or the other. Because you go back two games ago against Fresno State, defense great, offense bad, and then the next game, Offense good, defense bad. So when you can't rely on one side of the ball or the other, it's really hard to you know know what you're going to get when you hit the field. And, and certainly Nevada did not start that game well, falling into an early 14-0 hole and, and being down 28-7 to at halftime. Yeah, it's been flip-flopping, right? Uh, the defense shows up and the offense isn't there. The offense shows up and the uh, defense isn't there. So some, some metrics, actually, from, from this game. Uh, the Rebels had 526 uh, total yards, uh, 267 of which came from the passing game, 259 of which came from the rushing game. So a balanced attack mm -hmm. against a porous Nevada defensive performance that saw, you know, a lot of defenders, a uh, lot, lot of players on offense running open and, you know, kind of uncontested. That first drive, obviously, the connection with the receiver deep there, and then he kind of just walked into the end zone. Um, so, you know, unfortunate. But a positive note is that the offense did show up, 474 total yards of offense um, for a group that has been, you know, averaging around 322 yards a game. That's a good output, probably one of their best offensive outputs of the season. And that has to do in large part with Brendan Lewis's uh, performance. I know he had two interceptions, but he, I'd, I'd say it's probably one of his better performances in, in silver and blue, would you say? Yeah, that? I think so. I mean, it was a season high and career best in passing yards and also a career best in rushing yards. He ran for more than 100 yards. So I thought there was a lot of pressure on Brendan because a lot of people were saying, uh, throw the offense over to A.J. Bianco. Let's see what he has to offer. And, um, you know, the first two drives were pretty rough, quick, quick punts. Um, but after that, I think he settled in. And I think the biggest difference is he hit three deep balls. He hit Delvon Campbell on a long touchdown, another pass to Delvon Campbell down the field uh, about 40, 50 yards, and then a deep touchdown pass at the end of the game to Isaiah Crocker. So right just there, you're talking about 150 yards, and that's kind of the difference between what they posted and what they had been posting. So they found a weakness in that UNLV secondary. They attacked it. They hit some deep balls. Um, you know, two interceptions, as you mentioned. One of them was really crucial. Uh, Nevada's down 14 points inside the UNLV 10-yard line. They end up throwing an interception on third down, and UNLV goes and scores. And that, that was kind of, to me, the biggest play of the game was that interception. So I'm sure he'd like that back. But I think on the whole, um, you know, he played pretty well. I think he showed that he should, again, start this week against San Diego State. But, yeah, the issue was the defense. You mentioned those numbers in terms of balance. Nevada couldn't stop the pass or the run. And UNLV had not thrown the ball very well entering this game, nor had Nevada. So it was kind of interesting that they both had success throwing the ball. Um, but, yeah, Nevada's defense just was not up to the task. And it's really from the start. Nevada's played six games. It's allowed a touchdown on five of the first uh, opening possessions for its opponent. The one it didn't, Texas State drove the ball 70 yards and then a miscommunication between the quarterback and the wide receiver, and it was an interception inside the 10-yard line. So basically every time the opposition has gotten their first drive, they've just driven it right down against the Wolfpack. And a lot of them are early plays. The game against UNLV, the second offensive play for UNLV goes for a long touchdown. In the second half, the third offensive play for UNLV goes for a long touchdown. Uh, Nevada just does not seem prepared at the start of the game, and that goes back to coaching. I know Ken Wilson has talked a lot about his players are fighting their butts off. He has no qualms with how hard they're playing. Well, okay, if, if your talent is upgraded and your guys are playing hard, then it does come back to the coaching to make sure that you're able to put those guys in positions to win games. And I think particularly UNLV's offensive coaching staff led by Brennan uh, Marion. He's a first-year FBS offensive coordinator. Um, previously was at Texas as their passing game coordinator. I thought he did a remarkable job, and, and I think it kind of showed that, um, you know, Nevada's defensive staff was outcoached by UNLV's offensive staff. Yeah, I enjoyed some of the looks that they presented um, as an offense and really creative run calls, too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, you, 
you don't want to like you know project that you, you envy UNLV, but those are some creative play calls that they have there, and uh, it seems like you know they're heading in the right direction in terms of, as a program, uh, in terms of like you know like having a defense that can generate stops. Um, but you have to like look at it with envy and be like, you know, maybe Nevada can get some of these looks uh-huh. uh, because you know they, it's generating points for for that UNLV team. Um, well, I think but, that's the other difficult yeah. part is because UNLV is under a first year head coach, right, yeah. Barry Odom, and now he's got them five and one for the first time in 39 years. Um, they've won four straight games for the first time since 2013. So um, that kind of shows what you can do in a, a first year of a tenure. And now that Ken Wilson is in his second year you're not seeing that same progress here at Nevada. And uh, Barry Odom's a defensive-minded coach. He's done a a much better job with UNLV's defense. It's still probably the team's weakness. But, yeah, offensively in particular, that Brendan Marion hire looks like a great hire. Um, He's actually on uh, the Athletic put out a list of the top 10 uh, or top 30 assistant coaches who could soon be head coaches. And this kid's only 37 years old, and he was on that list. So, um, yeah, it's – I know a lot of the, you know, chatter after was, you know, progress offensively and steps in the right direction. But when you lose your rival at home by 18 points and you're in your second year of your tenure versus them being in their first year of their tenure, I don't personally think there are a ton of positives to take away from the game. Yes, the offense looked better, and we'll see if that carries over to San Diego State. But so often we've seen one good performance, like Nevada's defense against Fresno State, not backed up the next week. So will we actually see the offense be just as competent or more competent against San Diego State this week? And San Diego State's defense is not very good. It's kind of hard to believe that just based on what we've seen. It seems like you can get like 60-minute stretches, but you don't get that building game over game that they're improving game over game. They have some you know, good parts from one game to the next, but it's not consistently with the same unit. Yeah, and another thing that hurt him, I thought, was um, kind of special team snap views. Um, you know, a couple uh, false starts on a, on a punt inside your own 10. You know, you're, you're driving half the distance, half the distance, and I, all of a sudden you're punting well within your end zone, and that gave you an LV, you know, the great starting position. Another element was, uh, you know, you know when the kickoff happened and uh, Jamal Bell, you know, just he didn't, he didn't quite call for the fair catch. He just kind of thought, you know, stuck his arms out thinking that it was going to be, you know, driven through the end zone, and it wasn't. And it just kind of like – just mental errors that really, you know, hurt them. Obviously, another thing that uh, hurt them was the Kaleki Latu fumble. Um, but you really can't fault the guy. And yeah. his, his ankle was, like, <laughs> snapping in half. Um, but I thought, you know, if, if they convert there, they're going towards the, the blue zone, as they call it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think the game. fight was there. Yeah. I mean, I think they tried hard. They just almost have to play, like, perfect football to be able to win a game at this stage. Um, because of some of the other deficiencies that they have. So, you know, they got six more chances. This is only the midway point. It seems like it's it's been a lot longer than halfway through the season just because there hasn't been a, a ton of positive things to report. But, um, you know, they have six more opportunities. We'll see what they do with those. But certainly, you know, you lose to your rival. You're on a 16-game losing streak. You've lost to a couple FCS opponents. Uh, you're losing by 22 points per game compared to last year, 12 points per game. Um, you know, there's rightful hot seat talk with Ken Wilson. And I know... You know, uh, Ken is a great guy. Everybody wants him to win and be successful. But ultimately, you are judged as a football coach with wins and losses. And there just haven't been very many wins. I mean, you're talking about, what, 2-16 and 16 at this stage. And, um, you know, those two wins were, were more than 400 days ago. So it's just kind of crazy how the tenure started out so well, back-to-back double-digit wins. And um, since then, it's just snowballed. And they haven't been able to, you know, cauterize their wounds and go out there and play good football. So... Um, you know, San Diego State this week, I think that's a winnable game. Uh, San Diego State's yeah. not as good as it typically is. Uh, but, again, it's, it's going to have to be much cleaner, better football than what we've seen from Nevada so far over really the, the last two years. Yeah, uh, and that San Diego State team led by Brady Hoke, um, currently 3-4, and four, coming off a win against Hawaii. Um, before that, they had lost four straight games. Mm-hmm. Um, some people in San Diego probably calling for, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's been under some pressure. Um, what are they facing with the San Diego State team? Yeah, I mean, San Diego State, it's usually the defense. Last year, top 20 in the nation in points allowed per game, really the last five or six years. But this year, they've been terrible defensively, 109th in the country in points allowed per game. They gave up more than 30 points against Hawaii. Now, they did have four takeaways against Hawaii, and one of them was an interception return for a touchdown. But typically, when you play San Diego State, you know, you probably will take 20 points because of how difficult that defense is that's not been the case this year their defense has been 
very, very poor. Now it's been against a good schedule. Some of the losses, the teams like UCLA, Oregon State, um, Air Force, all those teams have spent time in the top 25, Boise State as well. But even their three wins, Hawaii, it was single digits, um, and Hawaii is not great. Ohio with single digits, Idaho State, uh, mediocre FCS school, single digits as well. So I'd say San Diego State's offense is a little bit better, but their defense is a lot worse, and that's why they're going to be you know, scratching and clawing to get to a bowl game. So that's why with the offense performing in its best way, its best game last week against UNLV, I'm very interested to see if that carries over against the San Diego State defense that's given up a ton of yards, I think like 470 per game. I think if Nevada does not turn the ball over because San Diego State is still creating takeaways, I think it can have a lot of success offensively. And I think the key is the faster starts. They've gotten off to such slow starts in every game except for that Texas State game. They've played six games. They've only led in one of them, that being the Texas State game where they were up 17-0 at halftime, and then the second half they just got steamrolled. So can they get some momentum early? Can they get an early defensive stop, which we have not seen so far really this season? And offensively, They've won the coin flip all six games. The last three, they've taken the ball to try and get that early momentum, but it's been a lot of three and outs and punts against UNLV. It was a negative rush. It was a sack. It was a penalty. And then it was a dump down pass, and they punted within like a minute. So um, that will be the big key is get some confidence. But it, it's a winnable game if they go out and play well, although they're you know a 13-point underdog. So the uh, sports books don't, don't think uh, Nevada's yeah. going to come away with this. I mean, hey, you're ranked you know, as the dead last FBS team in – in the nation, longest losing streak. So, you know, there's probably not much confidence that, you know, they could stack weeks and be like consecutive, you know, um, you know, performances within the offense. Uh, I don't know if there was a game to, to stack and, and do it. Maybe now's the time, you know, as you said, the San Diego state defense is suspect. Um, but until we're proven otherwise, we might expect another. You just feel like it has to happen at some point. I know. Point, like, come on. I mean, so you mentioned the longest FBS losing streak, Nevada at 16. After that, it's UMass at seven. So it feels like, you know, every FBS team, there's only two teams that have not won a game in the FBS. It's Nevada and it's Sam Houston State, which is fairly new to the FBS. They were previously a very good FCS program. It seems like, you know, no matter what, you're going to win a game here or there. Like, yeah. you're going to be close, and you're going to maybe get the takeaways, or you're going to get the lucky bounces, or you're just going to go out there and play a good 60 minutes. And Nevada's just not been able to do that, really, the last 13 months at this point. Because this year specifically, like, the games haven't been close. Um, you know, the game against Kansas was close in the fourth quarter. But outside of that, blown out at USC, blown out at Idaho. UNLV was more or less a blowout. Um, Texas State, they did have that early lead, but you know Texas State came back with 35 straight points, so that one wasn't very competitive in the fourth quarter as well. They haven't even given themselves a shot to maybe get that lucky bounce or to get that key takeaway late in games because they've been so far behind going into the fourth quarter. And Ken Wilson did say at his press conference this week, they just want to play a good three quarters so they got a chance in the fourth quarter, and that will be the big key. But it, it they have to win a game this season. Just losing – potentially that'd be 22 straight games that'd be the ninth longest streak in college football history like yeah. the streaks like this do not happen very often um so it is pretty crazy that Nevada is riding the 16 game skid yeah it's kind of funny because you know I, I work those games on Saturdays and I write my game stories after each game and you know like a lot of other reporters do they'll like write their game stories throughout the game and sometimes they'll have to com hit command A, delete, because something crazy happens, crazy comebacks. But it's felt like, yeah, for the past uh, 16 games, you know, I, I just you put can it write it at halftime. Yeah, I can write it at halftime <laughs> and just coast. You know, maybe yeah. that Kansas game was close. Um, but it is interesting, you know, like uh, it, it doesn't feel for the lack of talent that this team is struggling because they show glimpses of, of a, being a competitive team, like against Kansas, where you're like, oh, okay. That's that's a capable team that could you know get some wins yeah. and that was against the I, I don't know where they're ranked currently last week they were at 23 this week or yeah or they ended up between. losing to Oklahoma State okay so they're out of the they've had South their backup quarterback. quarterback the last couple of games uh, okay. but yeah I mean that's a a solid Big 12 team if you yeah. can play with a solid Big 12 team you should be able to compete in the Mountain West and they'll get some chances as the schedule lightens up here but um, yeah it's just been a long long time and. You know, I have to point to the coaches, and we can talk about the talent. And, like, last year I kind of used that as a crutch for the staff that they didn't inherit a very good situation. And, honestly, the roster is still not great. Right. But in year two, you do need to see that progress rather than regression. You do need to see those improvements 
rather than, you know, playing worse football than a year previous. And if you're not getting that with guys who you say are playing hard and guys before the season who they said were more talented, then that does fall back on the coaching staff. And Ken Wilson has been very upfront that he and his staff have to do a better job of putting his, their players in positions to be successful. And um, to date, you know, it, it seems like it's repeat whenever we sit down to talk about this stuff. But that breakthrough has to happen. And if it does happen, it has to happen sooner rather than later, I think, if Ken Wilson's going to get a third year on the job just because of how things have gone so, uh, so far. Yeah. Uh, we can play a game real quick. Rapid fire. This does not not constitute a prediction for you. Oh, okay. It's just a simple <laughs> win-loss. Uh, okay. You know, I'm like, oh, we're going to save that for Friday. Um, but we'll just go through the schedule real quick and uh, just, just give me, you know. you know, Win or loss. Win or loss. Okay. This weekend, San Diego State. Uh, I'll go loss. I know our friend Julian Delgadio, who works down in San Diego for the Fox affiliate. We had him on NSN tonight earlier this week, and he was saying he thinks this is a game Nevada could and potentially will win because he's seen San Diego State. So if you cover a team, maybe you focus more on their flaws. But I think on the road um, might be a little difficult for Nevada, so I'll say loss. Okay. Uh, fast forward another week, uh, another uh, – Home game, uh, Nevada Day weekend yeah. uh, against New Mexico. So New Mexico, uh, they've been struggling quite quite yeah. as much. Uh, they were also winless in the Mountain West last year. I'm going to go that. That's the win. Nevada snaps the 17-game losing streak. New Mexico's defense is not very good. Their offense is improved, though, so maybe a little bit higher yeah. scoring game, but the Wolfpack wins. Yeah, everyone has that circled, kind of like that's where you get your win. Um, I know most of Wolfpack Nation's probably checked out with this program, um, but that's you know that's kind of like what's out there for for available wins. But another week uh, goes by, and another bottom tier team in the the Mountain West in Hawaii. Yes, Hawaii. They've been struggling uh, a lot as well. They haven't really taken a big step forward in year two under Timmy Chang. So we're going to give Nevada back to back wins. They're going to win back to back games at home against New Mexico and Hawaii. Uh, feeling better about themselves at that point, they'd be two and three in conference. Mm. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. Let's see if this uh, winning streak continues when they play Utah State. Utah State. So that game's at Utah State. Uh, Utah yeah. State is one of three teams in the Mountain West scoring at least 30 points and allowing at least 30 points. So good offense, bad defense. Um, I think Utah State wins that game. I yeah. think they have their way against Nevada's defense. They score 40-plus points at home, and they end up snapping yeah. that two-game winning streak. It's funny because we're talking about the schedule right now, but it seems like – you know, uh, in these next you know four four games, it kind of, the schedule kind of softens up a bit mm. for them. Um, but of course, they then go travel to Colorado with a date with uh, Jay Norvell, yes. who has a team that's been playing pretty great as of late. I mean, a, an amazing uh, comeback victory last weekend. Uh, you know, like I felt like. The entire stands of Fort Collins just yeah. left. All the and people that were left after they were down. <laughs> yeah, they were down 20 points with less than six minutes to go, and they win that game. They recover an onside kick at Hail Mary. So um, that is also one of the teams in the Mountain West that there are three that score at least 30 points and allow at least 30 oh. points. So they've really gotten their passing game going well. Tory Horton's going to be a menace. Uh, Braden uh, Fowler Nicolosi, who was committed yeah. to Nevada, now their starting quarterback. He's been up and down. He's had some really good moments, but he does have a lot of uh, interceptions. So. Mm -hmm. I think unless Nevada has like four takeaways in that game, they probably lose it. So I'm going to say that's a loss for the Wolfpack. Yeah. And it's easy to to fast forward to the end of the season. We we kind of know what this result's going to be before we even get there. Um, but they end the season against Wyoming at home, senior day. Uh, so Wyoming's an interesting team. They remind yeah. me a lot of previous San Diego State teams, where yeah. their defense is super good, but their offense is suspect. So they're kind of going to play close games, whether they're playing like. Texas or whether they're playing like UNLV or Nevada mm -hmm. um there's not they're not necessarily going to blow out teams just because right. of some of the deficiencies on offense okay. but they could be playing for a spot in the Mountain West championship yeah. game so I will pick Wyoming in that so I got Nevada going two and four over its last six yeah games. uh and we talk about magic numbers and in this instance what's the magic number for Ken Wilson to retain his job. Yeah, so if I'm Stephanie Ramp, Nevada Athletic Director, I think four wins, four and two. You go yeah. four and eight on the season. Um, you know, you show some progress toward the back half against some softer schedule. I think that's enough to say, let's give you a third year. Let's see if you can carry that momentum on to the next season, 2024. I think if you go three and three, it's probably more of a coin flip. I think two wins or less than a move is probably made. So I'd say the magic number for full security and safety would be four wins. That makes sense. I mean, Rempy is a competitive um, athletic director, and, you know, she didn't bring Ken on. So you'd have to imagine the leash is kind of shorter um, than if, you know, if it was still Doug, you know, the person that brought him on. 
you're more likely going to have a longer leash. Um, so anything less than that, you're probably looking at a new hire. That's unfortunate. I mean, Ken loves the program and all that, but, you know, you just can't have similar records, yeah. back-to-back years, no signs of uh, progression. It's just yeah. it's a hard sell, especially in, in college football. Yeah, that's why I would want to be an athletic director. I mean, you <laughs> fire a head coach, you're basically firing 25, 30 people, all yeah. the support staff, the assistant coaches, um, you know, and it, it's difficult, but you got to do what's in the best interest of Wolfpack Athletics. And I think the best interest of Wolfpack Athletics is having a strong football and men's basketball program because that's what creates the money that trickles down to all the other sports. And um, usually you'll get a three or four year leash, but like you said, a little bit different situation with the athletic director not hiring the football coach. And then on top of that, if it does extend up to a 20 plus game losing streak, it's just hard to sell that to the community that this is the right staff to lead Nevada into the future. So they've got six games to, to show that they deserve to continue forward. And we'll see how they do against some softer competition. Yeah, exactly. The next four games, as we mentioned, against softer competition. So, yeah, start Saturday against San Diego State. Um, you'll have your preview, obviously, on, on Friday. Um, but it, sh- it should be an interesting matchup. But, you know, we'll see who shows up. The offense or the defense? That's, that's a, <laughs> well, that's the problem is trying to get both of them to do that. Yeah. If the offense plays like it did against UNLV and the defense plays like it did against Fresno State, then it has a very good chance of beating San Diego State. But just pairing those two has been very elusive for Nevada. Um, so, like we said, I, it has to snap at some point. I don't think Nevada goes an entire season without winning a football game. But there's not a lot of evidence that, you know, they are going to go out there and win a game. It's hard to predict like going into a game like yeah I believe enough in this team that they're going to go out and win now I did pick them to beat UNLV Um, I thought that they would get up for that game get a fast start get their crowd involved and be able to ride that emotion certainly that didn't happen Um, you know you fall into an early hole and then you're down 21 at halftime Uh, you're putting yourself in a very difficult position so I'm probably done picking Nevada to win until further notice just because I've seen it all, and you know maybe if they play a close game against San Diego State, I'll pick them to beat New Mexico. But it's just hard to forecast victories when you know week after week you see, you know, non-competitive second halves just in terms of where the scoring margin is more often than not. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. I mean, yeah, <laughs> last week we were talking about potential victory on Saturday, and you know, I, we we just thought you know things were trending in the right direction, but apparently not. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's never you know never uh, both or all three phases of the game just, you know, complimenting each other. Who knows? We might see that so at some point this season. That that would be a cool sight to see. Um, but, yeah, for now, it's safe to project losses for them. Um, real quick, before we get out, um, we're both Douglas uh, High graduates. Yep. Uh, and this weekend's – or Friday, right? This Friday's matchup of Douglas and Carson is the 100th uh, – anniversary of the the it rivalry. is that's cool yeah so 1923 is the first time douglas and carson played each other and we've seen a lot of rivalries in northern nevada over the years kind of fall by the wayside wooster and mcqueen had a nice rivalry reno sparks obviously had a nice rivalry they play at different levels now so you haven't necessarily seen one sustain as long as this so douglas goes in as the heavy favorite they've been the best 5a2 team by a good margin carson more toward the bottom of those standings but uh it would be interesting if uh you could get any pictures or footage of that 1923 game Right. Kind of see what high school football was like 100 yeah. years ago. Yeah. But that'll be a big one. It's at Douglas. So we'll obviously have coverage of that game. But yeah. not very often you could have two rivals say that they've played each other over 100 years. Like even Nevada UNLV, that dates back to 1969. So yeah. literally Douglas Carson, the oldest rivalry in this state for football. And that's uh, going to be a really cool game. Yeah, and it's a cool regional rivalry. I mean, I grew up in Carson but went to Douglas. My dad taught there, coached soccer. Um, but I have fond memories playing football against Carson and just the home in a way, like throughout my four years. Um, Did you guys win? Uh, no. That was when uh. Carson was a, a really good program. Um, Blair had Roman. Some heartbreaking losses, though. Yeah. You know, some last second field goals, you know. Uh, fumble bounce goes here or there. We we win the game. It was it was always it always seemed to be like that. You know, we we just couldn't get over the hump. It would just be an intense game, physical, and you know, just really close. Uh, you know, finishes and yeah, they they had our number. We we got them back on basketball. But, there you go. Carson um, beat Douglas last year. I yeah. I think it's going to be pretty lopsided in the Tigers' favor this year. Yeah, but you played baseball. And, I did. Uh, 
Did, did yeah, I played against Daryl was... Rasner. So yeah. he was at, at Carson High School. He's a year older than me. He's in the Wolfpack Hall of Fame, played in the big leagues, played in Japan for a long time, and has settled back in this area. So, uh, yeah, it was always fun. Those games were always packed. Obviously, Carson baseball back in the late 90s, early 2000s with Coach Ron McNutt was kind of the standard and, and really the whole state. Um, so whenever we got to play them, that was that was awesome. I did strike out against Daryl Rasner with the bases loaded and Douglas down by one run uh, to end the game. Uh, my junior year, it was <laughs> raining. I think the crowd was chanting my name to Douglas part, and I, I looked at three pitches, so didn't yeah. even take the what, – what, when someone's throwing 90 and you're a high school junior? Oh, no. Uh, yeah. It's it's a yeah. little bit different level. Yeah, it feels like a different level, right? Because I remember watching the Little League World Series over the summer, and they're like, oh, he's throwing 70. That's the equivalent of, like, yeah. facing a 105-mile-per-hour fastball. But obviously different distances and whatnot. But yeah. as a kid, you know <laughs> – you're like, I, I can only guess. So I was actually <laughs> ejected after that game, too, for uh, arguing with the uh, home plate umpire uh, <laughs> about that strike zone. I don't know. I'd, I'd also like to go back and see if those are strikes. I think if they were, I should have at least swung and, and attempted yeah. it. But uh, the coach uh, trusted me. It was a pinch-hitting appearance with the game on the line, and Ugh. I clearly did not come through okay. in that moment. <laughs> Man, that's painful. Yeah, it happens. But, you know, you've had some highs in your journalistic I've moved career. On. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Great articles, so uh, that, that makes up for it. Sorry, like, sorry to the squad for letting everyone down <laughs> back in the day. Yeah, it's probably still a, a you know a point of pain for a lot of uh, Douglas baseball folk. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, I thought we'd end on that just because we're both you know uh, Douglas kids, and uh, it's a unique rivalry. Always, always a cool thing to see, just because both sides churn out, mm -hmm. and it's uh, you know it's it's friendly, but sometimes it, it can turn heated. <laughs> it's. It, it's unique in, in northern Nevada, that's for sure. So I thought we'd talk about that for a second. Um, but thanks, as always, for uh, for joining me, Chris. Uh, mm -hmm. Good to talk th about this. It feels like we're going to have the same podcast over and over again because, <laughs> you know, we'll go on here next week being like, boy, the defense showed up, but the, the offense, that was horrible, and yeah. and vice versa. We'll, we'll flip-flop throughout the, the year. But, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, no problem. We'll do it again next week. Yeah, We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us inside the den. Uh, rate. Like, subscribe, wherever you take this in, uh, and we'll see you later.